there are Old Testament passages that talk about Jesus giving his life or the Messiah giving his life. I want to give you a couple of these passages that Paul's talking about. He's saying scripture was fulfilled when they killed him. Psalms 22 is one of them. Now, the Old Testament is full of prophecy. This is God telling the future before it happens. In fact, this is God's calling card. God said in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand. In other words, God was saying, I tell the future and I'm the only one who can. God tells us things before they happen. And there are some amazing Old Testament prophecies. There's a prophecy to the city of Tyre that it would be thrown into the sea. And that, that prophecy came by Ezekiel, who we know lived 600 years before the time of Christ. Alexander the Great, who lived about 300 years before the time of Christ. So 300 years after this was given by Ezekiel, when he came to the city of Tyre, they'd moved out on an island. He commanded his men to take the city bricks and throw them in the sea and build a causeway to get to the island. They used all the bricks of the city and they cut down the trees to finish the work and they moved their siege engines out and they took the city. And it literally was fulfilled 300 years after it was written. Think about how exact that is. You, Tyre, are going to be scraped clean and you're going to be thrown into the sea so that there's nothing left. And it happens literally by the hands of Alexander the Great, no less and it was fulfilled perfectly. The Bible is full of these kind of prophecies. Why would God do that? Why would God give us prophecies that we could look up and see and know that they came true? It's an obvious reason. So that we would know that God's word is true. If God can tell the future in the Bible, then, then, it, it, then God knows what's gonna happen spiritually and what needs to happen spiritually. If it's true prophetically, it's true spiritually. That's why I say it's God's calling card. And the Bible is unlike any other book. It's been under attack longer than any other book. And it's been able to stand because it stands on prophecy. And that's what Paul's saying. That these things were foretold. That the Messiah was going to die. Let me read you a couple of them. I'm going to read you a passage from Psalm 22. This is an amazing passage. You should read it later on. It is a first person account of a crucifixion a thousand years before crucifixion had been invented, or at least hundreds of years before it had been invented. Listen to what it says. This is, I believe that Psalms 22 is the thoughts of Jesus on the cross. Go, go and read it sometime, it's amazing. So here's what it says in verse six. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of a man, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him. These are the exact things the enemy said to Jesus while he was on the cross. Since he delights in him. Then he says, Many bowls of Bashan have surrounded me, have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths. Like a raging and a roaring lion, I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. When someone is crucified, their shoulders literally come out of joint. Their body hangs forward. The pressure is on their hearts. It describes it perfectly. It says, I have melted within, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue clings to my jaw. Jesus said, I thirst. You have brought me to the dust of death. For the dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Did you know there was a passage that spoke of exactly what Jesus went through, that talked about piercing his hands and feet, that was written by David, who lived a thousand years before Christ? Isaiah 53, three through six, talks about what Jesus went through as well, and talks about why he went through it. Why did Jesus go to the cross? What was it all about? Here's what he says. Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. 
Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The word iniquity is sin. Foretold in the Old Testament was the fact that the Messiah was going to die with his hands and feet pierced, and he was going to die for the iniquities of mankind. And that's why when Paul told the story of the, the, the Jewish leaders handing him over to Pilate and being killed, he says, and when scripture was fulfilled, they took him from the cross and they laid him in the tomb. So he's telling them these things were foreseen in scripture. Then in verse 30, it says, but God raised him from the dead. I wonder what tone Paul used when he said that, but God raised him from the dead. And he was seen for many days by those who came up with him in Galilee and in Jerusalem and who are witnesses to this people. This is only, again, from the crucifixion of Christ, 10 or 11 years. The people that saw him are still alive. The eyewitnesses are still alive. So to say that he is risen from the dead is one thing, but to say that the witnesses are with us today is another because now you can go and check. You can see who the witnesses are who were able to see him. Now, some Christians today still find it a really hard struggle to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. I'm honest with you completely when I tell you that I don't have that struggle. I believe that God raised him from the dead. Why do I believe that? Partially because I believe in the supernatural. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. And someone said, if God creates the heavens and the earth, then then everything other miracle he does is small in comparison because he created everything. That's a, it takes a miracle to create the world that we live in. Our world, you've heard the argument of being fine-tuned. You know, they, they found out recently that our universe has to be the size that it is in order to support life on earth. Now, I, I don't understand all that, okay? I can tell you what I read, but I don't understand it. But I don't understand electricity. I tell you about that as well. I don't understand gravity. I believe in gravity as well. God does miracles. And they are around us today. And it's, it's interesting to me that when I ask people, and this is one of the questions that I ask people who are non-believers, when I'm talking, or I don't know what they are. I don't know what they believe. And I'll ask them, do you believe in the supernatural? Do you believe in life after death? I'll follow that up. What do you think happens to you when you die? And almost 100% of people I talk to when I ask if they believe that there's something beyond the physical world, we'll say, yes, there is. And if you believe there's something beyond the physical world, if God foretelling the crucifixion of Christ and foretelling the resurrection rose him from the dead to mark the greatest work that was ever done, I find that plausible. I find that God would do that being something that is strong. Now, people have tried to argue by saying that Jesus was just a myth. He never existed. But do you know that there, there is not a scholar alive who says that Jesus was a myth? There are several sources in history that are not from the Bible. And these are historical sources. But there are st several historical sources that are not in the Bible that say that Jesus lived and was crucified under Pontius Pilate and that his tomb was empty. We have those things that are foretold to us. And so when Paul says to them, God raised him from the dead, and he was seen for many days for those who came up from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are the witnesses of the people, and we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to our fathers, God has fulfilled thus for their children, that he has raised up Jesus. What's he saying? Not only did the Old Testament foretell that Jesus would die on a cross for our sins, but it foretold that he would rise him from the dead. It goes on to say, and, uh, and it is also written in the second Psalms, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. Thus he spoke, I will give you to uh, sure mercies of David 
Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will, allow, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served him, his own generation, by the will of God, fell asleep, meaning that he died, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. The body of David was corrupted, but David said, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. So the Old Testament foretold that the, the Holy One, the Messiah, was not going to see corruption. Both Paul and Peter are not, the, are not only scripture heavy, they are also both have prophecies that are in them, and the Bible tells of these future events that have happened. Now the resurrection was foretold in at least three places. Let me give them to you. First of all, we have Psalm 1610, which Paul just referenced. It says this, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now the thoughts there is that David was saying there is an afterlife and you will, a Sheol doesn't mean hell, it means the grave. You will not allow me to stay in the grave and your Holy One will not see corruption. Isaiah 53, 10 says, after the, the, the one, the Lamb of God, the servant of God dies for our sins, it says this, after he's died, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he made his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Now, Jesus didn't have any physical seed, physical children, but he had spiritual children, and he had work that he had done, people coming to Christ. He will see his seed. He shall prolong his days. How do you prolong the days of someone who has died for somebody's sin? And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Psalms 22, which we read, which talked about piercing his hands and feet. Says, I will, this is Psalms 22, 22. I will declare your name to the brethren. How is this crucified person earlier in Psalms 22 going to now declare among the brethren? He has to be resurrected. He says, I will declare your name to the brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. The Bible speaks of the Messiah being raised from the dead. It wasn't something that was thought about afterwards. It was something that God foretold beforehand. And, and so far, both Peter and Paul in their messages talked about this.